What is going on, Kane Sport? It is Azubi Charles, and good morning to you all. It is Friday, February 24th, 2023, and I would like to thank everyone for joining us on Good Morning Kane Sport. Today, I'm joined by Matt Chidell and Steven Wagner as we break down the news of the day. First off, let's jump right into it with some recruitment. Steven, you caught up with Jeremiah, and you broke down his film, one of the top targets of that 2024 class in Miami. Just from watching this film, we all know he's one of the most talented players in that 2024 class. What did you see from that breakdown? Yeah, so this is part of a series that I'm doing more generally where we kind of take a look at some of the top targets that Miami's after uh, in 2024. They're real priority guys that we know they're after, um, guys that they want in Coral Gables. And we're kind of taking a look at how their junior seasons went, uh, some things they do really well, um, some areas where they need to improve and just kind of the thoughts that, uh, that we have on them more generally. And uh, to put it simply, Jeremiah Smith is the number two recruit in this year's class for a reason. He is unbelievably talented to me. He looks as good uh, as any receiver prospect that I can think of. Um, looking at him right now, I'd say he looks like the high school version of Marvin Harrison Jr. over, over at Ohio State. Uh, that's how good he is. That's how dominant he is. There is not a ton of things he really needs to improve on right now. Uh, of course, that's absolutely going to change uh, once he gets to the college level and once he obviously starts going up against college level talent. But he has absolutely destroyed the scene uh, down here in South Florida against some of the country's best talent, against some of the country's uh, best defensive prospects as well. Um Jeremiah Smith, like I said before, he's the number two recruit in the country for a reason. He's the number one receiver in the country for a reason. And I'm pretty sure he's the uh, number one recruit in the state of Florida as well. Um, there's also a reason why Ohio State wanted him so badly. And there's a reason why Miami is pushing for him. Um, now, uh, I think for Jeremiah to flip from or from Ohio State to Miami, excuse me, uh, I think this is going to be an instance where he's really going to need to see some sort of on-field results, on-field improvement next season from the Hurricanes. He's looking for he's he's looking for something to point to and say, yeah, these guys can develop me. They can make me as productive as Ohio State can. Um, if they're going to bring him to Coral Gables, Miami needs to show him that they can offer him either exactly what Ohio State can or they can do something better for him than Ohio State can do. You know, it's at this point, I, I really feel like the whole idea of, you know, showing love and, you know, showing so much attention. I, I feel like that really is moot at this point because this is a guy who's getting, you know, that same amount of love, that same amount of attention from everybody. It's I, I think it's to the point where it's, you know, what can you really do for me? If I go to your school, why will I feel like this is the right decision? Awesome, Steven. And sticking on to the topic of wide receivers, spring ball is rapidly approaching with the first practice kicking off on March 4th in our continuing series with our lovely, lovely Matt Shadell. Oh. Oh. We break down the wide receiver position and what keys will be to unlocking this group's potential in the spring. Matt, from overlooking the guys in that position group, just what have you seen? Well, look, you know, as everyone already knows, I ignore whoever, the, whatever the host says, I just ignore it, whether it's Gary, Azubi, I don't really care. So first I'm going to give my quick restaurant review. Il Gabbiano, only go if your father-in-law is paying, uh, was there um, last night. And, um, you know, they, they, they used to have zucchini chips they'd give to you, like, bread for free. And now that's $10.50 on the menu. On the plus side, the Dover Soul is only $85. On the minus side, my father-in-law was nice enough to, you know, you hold your hand up and ask for the check, and they they nod, and they take, I'm not kidding, they take the check, and they bring it to the table, and they put it right in front of me, and I'm not even sitting near my father-in-law, and then my mother-in-law is like, oh, Matthew, what a nice treat, thank you so much, <laughs> and I said to her, you know me, I, I'm like, I did not ask them to give me the check, this was a mistake on their part, and I handed it to my father-in-law. So, you know, there's some difficult situations in life you two will go through eventually if you find the right person, um, you know, if you don't hang out at Hooters too much with Gary. Uh, speaking of which, you know, let's address the elephant in the room for a second. And, uh, you know, well, the elephant not in the room, you know, Gary <laughs> Furman. Where, where is Gary Furman? Yeah. I, you know, I, I compare Gary Furman to an elephant 
because um, an elephant only runs 24 miles an hour faster than Gary Furman. So it's pretty comparable. Elephants run 25 miles an hour. Gary runs a, a nice trot at one mile an hour. Stephen Wagner, apparently, you know all about trotting. You deal with bulls or something like that. You were telling me the other day. But you could talk more about that later if you want. Uh, but, I would, but seriously, so I have not seen Gary in person, and I don't think either of you have either, since the end of the football season. Is it possible that somebody has sort of kidnapped him, taken him over, whatever the case may be, and it's just a digital reproduction they're putting on the screen? Because, you know, all we're getting from him is like a link. We click on the link and we see a video face of Gary Furman, and he seems to be moving his mouth and talking, but could there be someone else, you know, the, a puppet master? It's not really Gary Furman. I'm actually starting to get concerned because we don't get a link from Gary Furman, so Azubi sends us the link, and we go on the show. There's no Gary Furman. Do you guys think it's possible Gary Furman has been digitalized and is, like, being held captive by Mario Cristobal and his staff somewhere, like, because he reported too much news? Is that possible? I was under the impression he was most likely interviewing for the receiver's job. That's what I thought he was doing this entire time. <laughs> Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's great. Uh, well, that leads right into the wide receiver breakdown, as we asked it out. Uh, the wide receiver breakdown for me, and you guys can feel f free to disagree. I mean, you know, Zuby, you were at all the games yet last year. Steven, you, you don't know anything, but you can make stuff up really well. We already know that. Uh, so, <laughs> so I'm just kidding. Uh, Steven actually does an amazing job uh, of making stuff up. So the wide receiver breakdown... To me, the wide receivers weren't good last year, right? I mean, everyone agrees. And unless I'm mistaken, it's like the same wide receivers back again. Now, there's going to be a new wide receivers coach, obviously. Uh, there's a new offensive coordinator, obviously. Uh, Tyler Van Dyke missed a good portion of the year last year. Maybe that was part of the reason. But even, even those first few games he played, there just wasn't the production at wide receiver. So, you know, Matt Chodell, Matt Chodell is not overly optimistic at the wide receiver position because I'm a guy who, you know, you got to show me, you know, you got to show me like they had Charleston Rambo and Mike Harley at that when they were here and they were, you know, Charleston came in. We weren't sure he'd be great, but we thought it'd be good. Mike was coming back as a really, really good receiver. We were pretty optimistic. And then before last year, you know, Gary was telling everybody how bad the receivers were. I was saying it for a minute. Then I was like, well, they didn't look that bad in practice for a week or so. And then I was saying it again. And at this point... This is going to be probably, to me, the most interesting position to watch of the spring. And we'll be keeping a very close eye on all the positions. But wide receiver in particular, uh, can somebody get some separation? You know, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, I think, Stephen, that both, both the true freshmen are in, right? Ray Ray and, and, and Robbie are both early enrollees, right? Right. They are both yeah. early enrollees. Right. So, I mean, that'll be interesting to see because, um, you know, in, in the new offense uh, that's run by Mr. Awesome, you know, he uses the slot guys like crazy. His two top receivers last year were both mainly used in the slot, more than 50% of the time, each of them in the slot. So that's great, but you need an outside guy. And, uh, you know, I, I hear whispers like Isaiah Horton, for instance, is a guy nobody's really talking about. I've heard that he's really made a breakthrough. But again, you, you don't know. Like I was talking to uh, Mario just on the side one day last year when we just ran into him at um, in, in near the indoor facility. At Hooters? And he, Huh? At Hooters. And he was telling me how like Colby Young was like going to be great. He's going to be great, you know, and that sort of thing. Uh, and Colby Young was great for two games. It's the consistency I want to see. And until they get there and show that, you know, I know Xavier Restrepo certainly shows the hard work. He seems to have the quickness to get open at will, but he hasn't done it. He hasn't put up big numbers. Nobody, no returning wide receiver has more than I think it was 350 yards, 360 yards for the whole season last year. So I'm, I'm concerned. You know, I don't know if you guys have a different opinion on that. Steven, any thoughts on that? No, I, I think that's very valid. I mean, you know, I, I obviously didn't cover the team last year, but the first thing I did as soon as I got this job was I went back and I watched <clears throat> all of Miami's games from last season. And that was one of the first really glaring issues is, you know, where, where are the wide receivers? Uh, you know, wide receiver production was – just missing entirely. Uh, I did think that they got better in this recruiting class by signing Ray Ray Joseph and Robbie Washington. Uh, I think Ray Ray is going to be more ready quicker than Robbie Washington, especially from what I saw from Ray Ray at the all American bowl uh, down in San Antonio, where he really did look um, like maybe one of the best slot receivers at this entire event. Um, he impressed me a lot. He's, fast as lightning, uh, really good at getting open, uh, really advanced re or really advanced 
uh, awareness in terms of uh, zone defenses and understanding zone coverages and where he really needs to sink, where he's going to find the open grass. Uh, I thought for a high school kid, um, his high school coach, Luther Campbell, thinks uh, thinks that as well, or uh, I guess Uncle Luke thinks that as well uh, from the times that I had talked to him. Um, and I think Miami is going to take a step forward next year, um, it, it, at least in terms of getting Ray Ray Joseph and Robbie Washington. I'm not sure how quickly available Robbie Washington is going to be in terms of the production that he's going to bring immediately on the field. Uh, but yeah, like Matt said, for the most part, these are the same guys. So how drastically different do we think the expectations should be? Let me just tell you, it's such a pleasure to have someone who actually understands genius appreciates genius and says they agree with genius. Thank you, Stephen Wagner. For once, somebody agrees with me on the show. Now, going to a little bit of recruiting updates that we have on the site. First, we'll start off with the nephew of legendary Miami linebacker Rohan Marley, Chris Cole, who recently picked up an offer from the Canes. And I had the chance to speak with him and to say he was ecstatic is an understatement of how happy he was when he got that call from the Hurricanes and picked up that offer. So make sure to check out that update on our site. Hey, all- by, by the way, guess who covered Rohan Marley in college? Um, Matt Chanel. No, you think I'm that old? What's wrong with you, Azubi? <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah. I, I covered I covered Rohan Marley in, in college. It's he um he was he was fearless, man. He was fearless. I, I assume you guys do know he's the son of Bob Marley, right? Um, no kidding. You, you did know that, right? It wasn't just a coincidence. He didn't rename himself. He didn't like go and change his name legally to Marley. Um, I learn new things every time I'm around you. Well, yeah, there you go. (laughs) Have you heard him sing? No, I have not. No, nobody has. Rohan or Bob? Rohan. (laughs) I've heard heard Bob. I've heard Bob sing uh, uh, quite a bit. I love Bob Marley. And this uh, another recruiting update that we have is from a member of the 2020. 2023 class yes 2023 not 2024 butler community college three-star cornerback anthony robinson he's currently committed to colorado Deion sanders you know what happened last time we were in a battle with that guy over defensive back how that ended up but robinson will be taking a visit to the university of miami and steven caught up with him steven what were your impressions after talking to him yeah, first question that I had for him was, you know, so you're committed to Colorado. You've been committed to Colorado since December, but you didn't sign uh, during the early signing period. You didn't sign on National Signing Day on February 2nd. You know, why is that? And he just chose not to comment, and we skipped right to the next question. Um, well, hold so, on, not so, not so fast. What did, he, what did he actually say when you asked him that? Did he say, I don't want to talk about it, or is just the next question? Like, what did he actually say? Well, we were doing this over. Te- we were doing this over text oh, message. Text. And okay, got it. He respond and absolutely nothing happened. And so I texted him <laughs> one more question immediately after that, and within thirty seconds, he responds to that yeah. question. So I've, I've I, been there. I've been there. So yeah, he. he, That's, he yeah, when when I text my wife, that happens all the time. <laughs> you know. So yeah, he he chose not to. Uh, he chose not to comment on. He chose not to answer. Um, so, you know, we're all kind of sitting here kind of scratching our heads a little bit, but he wants, uh, he wants to sign somewhere in May. Um, he's also got a visit plan to get out to Maryland. He's also hearing from Oregon. And then obviously he's going to come down to Miami. He hasn't actually been offered by Miami yet, but they do want to get him on campus enough for a visit. So clearly there is a baseline level of interest there. Uh, but kind of the first thing that I kind of thought that this might mean, because he is a 2023 kid, so he would be a summer enrollee and he would be on campus for the fall and fall camp and all that stuff. And is, well, kind of the first place that my mind met, went was maybe this is a kid where if they're kind of uncertain about where their depth is at uh uh, at cornerback after the spring ends, if they're still kind of raising questions about the secondary more generally, uh, then maybe they'll suddenly decide, hey, this is a kid that we definitely 100% want. Uh, this is a kid that we're going to go ahead and offer. But like I said, they clearly have enough interest in him and they care about him enough that they want him down here on campus uh, during March. And we all know that March is going to be a huge recruiting month for Miami. They've already got the March 4th Junior Day uh, shaping up. That's probably going to end up being uh, the biggest recruiting weekend that we're going to have uh, in the first half of 2023 outside of the spring game itself. 
Um, and a lot of kids are already lining up visits uh, to come in March, and uh, uh, Robinson's definitely one, one of them. Yeah, let me just add that um, the, the May portal is expected to have a lot of action and a lot of top names versus the December portal. The December portal is going to be known for, and you could already start seeing it, guys who are basically jettisoned from teams where they say, hey, you're just not going to fit here. You're going to be you, you, maybe a bad attitude second teamer, maybe a, just a third teamer is never going to play and they need a spot. Those are the kinds of guys you see in December. That's why you get thousands of guys in December. May is going to be really interesting because that two-week period, if there's a team where the coach feels they're super close to, uh, you know, to having an amazing team and there's missing that one amazing receiver, like Miami, right? <laughs> uh, just to name a random program, not, not like we cover them or anything. Uh, you can go out and potentially, through back channels, find a guy who might be willing to transfer to Miami or to any other school. So, you know, when, you, when I, you know, I read your, I read your, you know, your story, obviously, Stephen, because every once in a while I decide to read your stuff. And uh, basically, you know, when these things happen, when somebody is committed to a school and could sign or could have signed and didn't, when Miami's after him, wants him to visit, but hasn't offered, you're hundred percent right. It's usually a, a backup, you know, plan B type thing. Probably Colorado hasn't decided if they actually want to take him or not and lock in the spot. Miami, same deal. And you're right. You know, if, if, if the play uh, of the secondary is not real good, if, you know, Damari Brown or the other transfer cornerback they took doesn't shake out the way Miami thinks they should, then you have to do something. And you can go to the May portal or you could try to grab a kid like this or whatever it may be. Uh, but I think it's going to be really interesting to see, you know, which avenue they take. Because I do think they're going to add uh, at least another two portal guys. And, and we'll see. I mean, there, there could be two to five more portal guys if they're free agents in Mario Cristobal's mind that, that would come on board. Awesome. Also tonight for our baseball Canes fanatics out there, our Hurricanes return home to face Dartmouth. They've been heating up as of late after that first loss to Penn State. Yo-Yo Morales has been finding his groove, our big home run hitter. Freshman second baseman I really like, Blake Sear, has been doing his thing as well just as a freshman. And as always, stay tuned for any news that may come up on the website today. Well, that is all that we have for this episode. Of oh, Wonder wait a minute, Azubi. You're forgetting your favorite sport. What, what am I forgetting, Matt? Please what's your do. favorite sport? Football. Rugby. Well, okay. You're, you're, what sport are you covering right now? Basketball. You don't want to talk about basketball at all? We've got some big things coming up. You know, tomorrow against Florida State, we're now first in the ACC. That's Thank what you. I wanted to hear you say. I'm glad Thank you're paying you. attention. Thank you, Boston College. They knocked off Virginia uh, two nights ago, I believe. So that was a big, big step in the right direction for Miami as they're now sitting in first place in the ACC, control their own destiny. So these last two home games against FSU, who they beat by, I think, a million points earlier this year in Tallahassee, and Pittsburgh, a team that they lost to earlier this season. So make sure to check out that tomorrow at the Watt. And, and somebody posted on the YouTube comments, or maybe it was on our message board, I don't even remember anymore, it all sort of blends together, uh, like Steven's mustache. So basically, what I don't understand is somebody commented that you and I, Azubi, talked about it. Stephen was, was not on that show, but we commented that we don't think that fans are super excited about winning an ACC regular season title in, you know, in the ACC for, for basketball. And somebody said, what are you talking about? You know, I'd, I'd be very excited for that. And I tried to explain to them. It's not like football, right? In football, you had to win the Coastal. Now you have to be in the top two. But you had to win the Coastal, so you had to do that just to get to the ACC title game. You had to win the ACC title game just to be, hypothetically, in the national title picture. Uh, in basketball, you don't need to do either of those things, which, to me, takes the luster off of it. You know, I don't know how they can change it. You can't change it. It is their system. Uh, but it takes the luster off it to me. You could finish fourth in the ACC, all the regular season ACC schedule does to me is tell you what seed you're going to be for the ACC tournament. And if you do well in the ACC tournament, you're going to have a higher seed in the NCAA tournament and hypothetically play some easier teams in the first round or two. Uh, but aside from that, like, there's no value to me. I'm sorry. Fans may not like it. I really, if Miami finished second in the ACC regular season, it wouldn't bother me as long as they have the same record. Like if Virginia had beaten BC, if Virginia had one out and Miami had one out, I would not have cared less than if Miami 
won out and Virginia, and Virginia didn't win out. Because all I care about right now is Miami setting itself up for the best possible seed in the NCAA tournament. And the only way to do that is to win. The NCAA selection committee is not looking at, oh, you know, Virginia lost two of its last four games, so Miami finished in first place. So now we're going to give them a two seed instead of a three seed. Like, that's not how they work, you know. Uh, that's just my opinion. Fans can disagree. I mean, do you guys disagree with me for once? Uh, are you going to pull a Gary Furman on me? No, I I'm heard- say if a team has a chance to win a championship, I'm not going to say no to that. I mean, the, I mean, it's a, it's a banner for the sake of having a banner. Although I will say, a regular season championship does not mean a freaking thing if you do not do business in the if you don't take care of business in the NCAA tournament. All of that is for naught if you don't win the games that you're supposed to win in the tournament. And you yeah. know what makes winning yeah. cool? It's like going to Hooters and not getting the chicken wings. It's like just getting a, a soda and enjoying the ambiance and leaving. I mean, what's the point? Why would you go to Hooters and not get chicken wings? I'm more of a burger guy at Hooters, but hey, that's another conversation for another day. I interrupted you, Stephen. Go ahead. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. But what were you saying? But yeah, ultimately, this all comes down to this all comes down to seeding for the NCAA tournament. And you know, regardless of if you're going to be the regular season conference champion or not, you know, I. I agree. You know, what does that matter uh, as long as you're going to get the seed that you want? You know, it, it, I really like the chances better of, you know, getting out of the first round and getting or getting out of the first weekend, excuse me, uh, if you're a three seed or a four seed than if you're a five seed or a six seed. And the numbers back it up. The lower your seed is, the more prone to an upset you probably are. But also, you know, let's also acknowledge here that the better teams are usually the ones who get the higher seeds. And so those teams have to play their way in uh, into getting those higher seeds. And it just so happens that most of the teams that do put up the resume to get that higher seed also happen to be regular season conference champions. Yeah. And by the way, when Miami was seeded second, um, I remember seeing some sort of a projected bracket in the in the ACC tournament where I think their toughest team, the highest seeded team that they would face before getting to the finals was like Wake Forest. But that was being second. Now that they're first, I think they're going to have to either face North Carolina or Duke, which let's face it, you know, they have more five stars than Miami. You know, they just do. Like that's the nature of the beast. You never really want to have to face them if you don't have to until the championship just because even though they're not having great seasons, even though they're somewhat of a mess, like they're really, really good. And if they ever get their stuff together – they're one of the top four teams in the country. Uh, so, you know, it's it's weird to me that I, I would take being the second seed and having an easier path to the conference title, just knowing that, you know, Miami, you know, if you can beat a couple teams easy, you get some rest, right? You're not grinding your guys because it's a grind. The, the, these tournaments can be a grind. Uh, so you want to beat the first team easily, second team if possible easily. Um, just keep the guys rested. Whereas it's a little tougher road, in my opinion, I think, is the first seed, unless the bracket has changed substantially since I last saw it. So, you know, food for thought. Carolina is an absolute tire fire. They are really bad right now. They are not playing good basketball by any means, but I'm terrified of them because this is a team that went to the national championship last year and was a terrible second half away from winning a national championship. And you know who they beat to get to that national championship? They beat Duke. And you know what else Carolina has? All of those players who played in the national championship last game, they brought them all back. They said, hey, let's get together. Let's run it back. And the other reason why I'm really terrified of them is because the way that Carolina looks right now, they're probably going to be in desperation mode uh, once they get to that ACC, once they get to the ACC tournament, because if they don't beat, I think they play Virginia and someone else. It, it, it might actually be Duke uh, the second time around. If they don't win both of those two games, they will finish the regular season without a quad one victory, which means they're probably going to have to run the table and get that and get that auto bid um, from the ACC tournament if they want to get into March Madness to begin with. And so I don't want to see that team as a – uh as it like from i don't want to see that team period especially not if they're going to be desperate we know the talent level that they have and we know what a desperate carolina team can do i tripped over my own words there for a second well i mean i don't even understand a word you said after tire fire i, I lost you after tire fire i was just so focused on is tire fire a bad thing is that is that bad a tire fire i mean it takes like 800 degrees to even start the tire fire which seems pretty good like that's a pretty good temperature to get to so that's a good thing 
And then the fire is going to last a while. They don't burn out. So you get nice heat. You could make some nice s'mores on there. So I, I don't understand why tire fire is such a bad thing in the Stephen Wagner world. Matt, what world did you grow up in where you got excited for the tire fire? Let me tell you, I didn't have any tire fires where I came from. I never even heard the term tire fire, okay? We use tires to drive our cars on. Apparently, where you grew up, you set them on fire and made s'mores. Like, that's not on me, bro. Matt, you know nothing about where I grew up. <laughs> Before we go down to the Oats tire fire lanes again, I'm just going to wrap it up here. I know we talked about football, baseball, and basketball, everyone's favorite sports. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this morning to kick off your Friday and hope you enjoyed. If you like today's show, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up. If we get enough likes, hopefully Gary Furman will come back from Hooters and <laughs> grace us with our presence. Gary Furman doesn't exist. He's a digital reproduction face. He doesn't even exist anymore. We'll call, we'll call him CGI Gary now from now yeah, on. I love that. That's CGI great. CGI Gary. And if you did like this video, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and canesport.com if you already haven't. For Steven Wagner and Matt Shadell, I'm Azubi Charles. Thank you for joining. And I hope you have a great day and an excellent weekend. Bye-bye now.